Sorry, Kiko. Last question. I will... Okay, so welcome to our forum on vaccine and health diplomacy in the time of COVID-19. So I am Bianca. I am with the International Studies Department and I will be facilitating the discussion for today. So I guess to begin with, may I call on um, our chair uh, from the International Studies Department, uh, Mr. Francis Esteban, to give us the opening remarks. Kiko, please. Right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to our distinguished guest, Dr. Joel Beneventura, to our Dean and Associate, to our Dean, Dr. Rovena Capulong Reyes, Associate Dean Mark Isla, to our colleagues and to our students, good afternoon. COVID-19 was a disruption. Uh, it disrupted the economy as well as the capability of our public health system. It tested our society and on a larger scale, the entire international system. Thus, we saw how crucial an issue is public health in the field of international relations. We further see this in the development of the vaccine against COVID-19. We saw how countries were engaged in diplomacy to procure these vaccines. We also witnessed how several concessions were given by some states in exchange for a vaccine from our other manufacturing countries. Indeed, the COVID-19 vaccine has become the new currency of contemporary diplomacy. We're very lucky today to have someone like Dr. Joel, who is directly involved in our government's initiative to acquire vaccines. I'm confident that this lecture today would shed light on the topic and further give us the confidence to have vaccine shots whenever it is available. And as the world continues to move with the virus still ever present, we should expect that international affairs will continue to be affected and vaccine diplomacy will be ever more relevant. So once again, welcome everyone to this forum. I hope we'll have an insightful afternoon. Uh, this is a very exciting topic for all of us, uh, not only for international studies students, but across all disciplines. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Kiko, for that opening uh, remarks. So I should I call on um, our speaker already or? Okay, so I guess I will be introducing our speaker from um, the Department of Health. He is currently the Division Chief um, of the Bureau of International Health Cooperation, and he is also involved in uh, vaccine health diplomacy. So before our um, forum, we were informed, of course, naturally that he has been with uh he has been advocating for uh vaccine health diplomacy but uh to further um add no to introduce his credentials may i call on one of our professors uh, sir wayne oiseko please to also introduce dr benaventura Sir Wayne. Hello. Okay. Hi, Sir Wayne. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So let me introduce to you our speaker for this afternoon. Dr. Joel Bonaventura is a medical doctor and a career public servant with over 14 years in government service experience. His interest and expertise lies in the fields of public health, global health diplomacy, migration health, and health policy manage and management. He's currently serving as the Division Chief of the International Relations and Diplomacy Division at the Department of Health, 
Philippines Bureau of International Health Cooperation, the office which facilitates and coordinates all foreign affairs-related matters for the DOH, including the current international COVID-19 assistance to the health sector and the COVID-19 vaccines uh, negotiations and access to the COVAX facility. Further, Dr. Benaventura is the Medical Director of Child Health Family International Philippines, an NGO based in California, USA, focusing on uh, global health education. He also serves as Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Philippine Society of Public Health Physicians and is currently a Global Health Leadership Executive Program Fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, Dr. Benaventura uh, graduated with honors cum laude at the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Medicine and Surgery in 2004. He completed his postgraduate internship at the University of the Philippines PGH in 2005. He earned his master in public health degree at the Boston University in the United States with a dual concentration in international health and health policy and management in 2011 where he also was awarded the John Snow uh, Incorporated Award in International Health. During his master's studies, he had internship in uh, prestigious health, uh, public health institutions such as the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, Doctors Without Borders in the United States. Prior to that, Dr. Bonaventura also served as a doctor to the barrio with seven years of grassroots experience as a rural health physician and later as municipal health officer in uh, a municipality in Romblon, Philippines. So I think um, his uh, bio note uh, tells us a lot about his experience. So I think uh, without further ado, let us all welcome Dr. Joel Benaventura, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Sir Wayne. Uh, I, I usually just give that, but not require every time to read the whole thing. So I'm I'm honored to to for the time to uh, for that. Um, thank you so much. Isang uh, malusog na hapon sa ating lahat. I'm speaking here at the uh, Department of Health and. All right, just wait a moment. All right, hello, my apologies. That was my, actually my undersecretary. I think he has some questions, so. <laughs> um, so anyway. Uh, thank you very much for the far from the Far Eastern University uh, Institute of Arts and Sciences for this invitation. Um, I appreciate this. As I was telling the group a while ago, this has been really my uh, somehow my advocacy to actually uh, I'd say conquer <laughs> the international studies uh, departments and just uh, let people know about uh, you know the field of health diplomacy, which is uh, I think quite a new field, it's an evolving field, but I think with the uh, with, uh, unprecedented time that we're having at the moment due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this has really, um, you know, highlighted the need for, you know, health diplomacy, especially in terms of, uh, you know, studies and, and I think here in the Philippines, uh, I think it's not really, uh, I would say, not a recognized um, field of study. All right. So um, I hope that I can give justice to this uh, to this afternoon's uh, session. I thank the organizers for a very well um, uh, organized uh, uh, session today. Um, so maybe we can proceed with the slide. So I have to say first that um, next slide, please. That. Um, First, I have to disclose that I have no financial conflict of interest with any vaccine manufacturer. I don't work for them. I work for the Philippine uh, government, the Department of Health. However, I have to say uh, a caveat that the opinions and insights expressed here are mine and not of my employer. 
Um, I am a public health and health diplomacy expert, not a vaccine expert. So there are other experts who are more knowledgeable about, uh, you know, vaccines, which I will uh, definitely, of course, that's a subject matter. So I will touch on that. Um, some of the negotiations are still ongoing. So what I, I say here or what I uh, tell you this afternoon, it, um, things can change. At any minute. All right. Next slide. So this afternoon, basically, I have like, I divided it into like seven sections. So just first a bit of an introduction on the overall, you know, scenario that we are, uh, we have at the moment, then um, I'll, I'll discuss about, you know, vaccines in general, and what we need to understand about vaccines. So I, I put here the section on vaccines are not all created equal, because in order for us to really um, I'd say analyze what's happening internationally or what's happening in diplomacy. I think we need to know about you know the basics of vaccine and the, and the nuances that are are in terms of vaccine production of what vaccines are for and stuff like that. And then I'll go through um, the third part, which is the main thing on COVID nineteen vaccines and health diplomacy and some thoughts on that. And then I'll go through what I call the vaccine multilateralism. So at least you know something about the COVAX facility. I think some of you have known know about that facility. Maybe you have read about it. I can tell you what's really about. And then I'll discuss uh, after that what's it uh, beyond COVAX, which is um, bilateral, regional, and other multilateral mechanisms that we are uh, using. And then just some final thoughts on uh, other considerations on the access to COVID-19 vaccines and then just some personal insights. Uh, right. And I think someone put in the chat that if you have any questions, uh, you can type them uh, here. We'll, I think uh, as for Sir Francis, we'll have uh, some clarificatory, some time for clarificatory questions at the end of the session. All right, so let's go through this. Um, I think you know about the status of the pandemic. I think it's been every day. I think one way or the other, we're getting some news about this. Like, I think yesterday was the highest number of cases in our history here in the Philippines. Globally, um, just trying to paint a picture that it, uh, the COVID-19 has affected 125 million people already, 2.7 million deaths. And the U.S. being the leading number of uh, leading uh, country with the most number of cases, and I think it is in this context that I think it's important for us to realize that first, diseases do not recognize borders or nations. There is no concept of nation states here that, that we can talk about, right? And uh, I would emphasize that a health threat anywhere is a health threat everywhere. So you remember that December, I think this late December in 2019, when China, you know, said that, you know, in Wuhan, there's this disease and, and um, uh, they, they are studying it. And it's from Wuhan, China, that now you see 125 million cases in 192 territories. So a health threat really somewhere is a health threat everywhere. So in the context, in this context as well, um, it's important that um, we, we think about, you know, how the spread of disease is also governed and, and what um, mechanisms do we have in place like the international health regulations and how this affects, you know, the spread of disease. But um, as we all know, um, this, the COVID-19 um, disease is um, can be suppressed by vaccines. And uh, as Gavi has mentioned, developing a vaccine against COVID-19 is the most pressing challenge of our time. And nobody wins the race until everyone wins. And it is in this context that really the race has begun, right? So I think the political pressure is high up or or I think not just the Philippines, but basically all 
all states, all nations that, you know, they have to deliver the vaccines that are required. And it is in this context as well that we know that the negotiations and the diplomacy are happening. All right, next slide. So just another slide to, next slide please. Just, just another slide to show you the vaccination landscape. Previous slide, please. Previous slide. Yeah, just to show you the vaccination landscape at the moment. So I, I got this uh, for some of you who might uh, have visited the site, the, this data, uh, this site, Our World in Data. It's a very useful site. So maybe some of our students here who are in this um, session today, if you want to explore further, you can go to this Our World in Data um, site that um, you see the, the, the uh, countries that are currently covered in terms of vaccination and uh, COVID-19. So you see Philippines is not yet because uh, we just started uh, vaccination uh, a few weeks back. Right? Next. So, so you see in the map, you also see, you know, countries where there are, uh, you know, better vaccination rates and then in other countries where they're actually none. And so you see really the inequity in terms of the vaccination. And I think that's one of the things that, that we'll, we'll be trying to discuss this afternoon. Yes, next. So, but before we go into further detail about diplomacy, I want to um, deal first with the issue of the nuances about vaccines because it's important that when we look at all these issues that you see in the news, that you see in TV and social media, that you remember that vaccines are not all created equal. So probably you've heard about all this like, um, you know, what vaccines are coming in. So currently, we only have two vaccines in country, that of Sinovac and, uh, and AstraZeneca. But not our vaccines are created equal. Why? Next slide, please. So you see, in terms of creating vaccines, uh, those with probably some background in molecular biology or um, say, knows more about like biochemistry and stuff like that you know that there are various types of um, platforms we, we call them vaccine platforms wherein you it's, it's basically how you will introduce the vaccine into your body so there are five types which are viral vector dna rna protein and killed or attenuated virus so it's, it's hard for me to explain everything, but basically uh, this vaccine platforms as, as um, we know them, it offers different advantages and disadvantages. For example, DNA vaccines uh, are quite the new ones. So in terms of, um, so they basically, you, we, they basically incorporate it in the DNAs and the RNAs before it goes into the host cells. And this ones, it's easier to produce. That's why you see uh, in terms of the vaccines that are being used all around the world, it's Pfizer and Moderna, which are the ones that are being used because they're easier to produce, the DNA and RNA vaccine. However, these DNA and RNA vaccines, they are, um, they are like uh, new technologies. So unlike, say, for example, Sinovac, which is inactivated or killed or attenuated virus. It uses like this old tested proven technology. So our most of our vaccines like BCG, like the most trusted vaccines that we've used in our expanded program on immunization, they are inactivated vaccines. So, so, um, so in a way, in terms of technology, I would say Sinovac, the platform that Sinovac use is actually more um, trusted because it's been, you know, we've been using it for the longest time ever. So we don't have yet long-term studies, say, for example, for, for RNA and DNA vaccine. AstraZeneca is actually a viral vector. So it's like they use, I think, chimpanzee adenovirus to bring, it, bring the, uh, bring the um, vaccine into the host cells. 
So it's also quite a new platform, and uh, but I think it's more studied. Um, like I think the the polio vaccines are are using viral vectors as well. So um, so you see, going to the right, it's more really like the traditional approaches, and going to the left, my left basically is um, are more of the newer and novel vaccine approaches. So so. So I'm telling you this because it's when you say like, okay, Astra or, or Novavax or Pfizer, Moderna, they are not, you know, they have different platforms, right? That they're using. And so they're not really like in terms of the safe. So you can imagine the safety profile, the long-term studies that have been done, the efficacy and all these things will be dependent on also a bit on the vaccine platform. Next slide, please. So, yeah, so basically, um, I think this is just a repetition. I, I've mentioned some of it. Uh, so, but this one shows you that, you know, when you produce the RNA and the DNA, they're actually uh, produced at the, uh, uh, at the lower, uh, relatively, production cost is lower, but we know that it's not the case because they're more expensive, actually, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. So next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so also in terms of, we have to think that in terms of the vaccines, uh, of course, uh, in terms of the doses, um, there are different. Um, I think this one is an old, uh, I think I failed to um, uh, do this because like for Astra, it's actually now two doses. Um, and then uh, I think the only one that is one dose is CanSino and uh, Johnson & Johnson. So, so for Astra, initially they said it's one dose, but, uh, but now it's, I think, two doses. And then in terms of the timing, so they have also various timings. So you can get uh, day one and then you get vaccinated again as a booster, like after how many days. Um, some will be 21 days, some would be 14 days, some other will be 28 days, yeah. In terms of vaccine storage, they're also different. So like the concern for the RNA and DNA vaccines is that you need special uh, storage for them. You need what they call the which means that uh, you have to store them in very low temperature, which is not the ones we use for our normal vaccine. So the normal vaccine temperature that we use for like, you know, the RBCG, our DPT and the other vaccinations is two to eight degrees. So in terms of, you know, if we do get like a, a, an RNA or a DNA vaccine, then you have to provide an ultra cold chain for them. So. Yeah, and I think um, also in terms of the country of development, if you look back on the second column, it's important that uh, you know you see where where these countries are, and I think uh, it, part of this is the I think the main topic that we're discussing today. It's also like the interplay. If you would see uh, the major powers uh, are here and. Uh, as some would say, the only superpower has control over the, the three uh, vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and Janssen, which I think now uh, is re we can really see it that, you know, uh, I, I, uh, as a practitioner, I really see that Pfizer vaccines, Moderna vaccines are really not going out anytime the U.S. <laughs> has finished its vaccination. So, so yeah, so there's that. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, and also uh, you see that um, the when the vaccines were were being developed, but which by the way has been developed in a, an unprecedented rate. So it's the fastest, I think, scale up and fastest vaccine development that we have seen in in centuries or maybe uh, ever. Um, but you would see that it differs in terms of the age. That's why, you, like say, for example, Sinovac was only tested for, for 18 to 
to 60. So we cannot actually give Sinovac to elderly. So yeah, for those of you, of course, you have parents. If you have parents over 60, um, of course, you have to warn them that they cannot get Sinovac because it's not tested beyond 60. So we have to wait for the AstraZeneca dose because that one is, is tested for elderly. So things like that. So it's so I'm just trying to tell you that in terms of the platform, the logistics, the, the dosage, the exclusion criteria, and all this, I mean, if we talk about, say, Sinovac and we talk about AstraZeneca and Pfizer, you have to always think about all this, um, you know, nuances and details because sometimes people say it's a it's easy to say, oh, we should get this vaccine, we should get this vaccine, not noting that, okay, logistically, so if we, I mean, in terms of getting, say, Pfizer, but you have to store them in minus 70, and we don't have cold chain for that initially. So these are, I think, very important points, and I think this is also part of the negotiations, really, when we consider all the countries. And it's, it's, it's very important that, you know, uh, consider also the frame that you know I think the supply right now is really limited and so you only have that golden opportunity to get the vaccines it's not like as if you have money and you can get all the vaccines that can, that's not it's it's not the real world scenario that's the ideal world that okay maybe I can choose whichever vaccine I want and I can negotiate no it's really supply dependent at the moment. And, and I, I, I will tell you a bit more on that later. Next slide, please. So to summarize, vaccine candidates use different uh, technology platforms and this has implications in how they can be used. You know? So like vaccine characteristics and study settings like um, affect the deployment later on and like say um, immunogenicity is an issue, safety profile, scaling up of manufacturing, um, if one vaccine is easier to to produce or manufacture versus the old technology that we're using, the cold chain requirement. So what this is telling us is that one vaccine may be more suitable for a target group and a specific region than another. And so in that sense, we really we cannot just place our our you know our our eggs in just one basket basically. So we in a way, we have to have this mix of vaccines, and there is really a need for guidance and policy advice for this uh, vaccine, uh, uh, for choosing this vaccine. Next slide, please. All right. So hopefully, um, we got a sense of of the nuances when we think about vaccines. Because then now, if you if you know about all these things, then you can think about now. Um, about you know the diplomacy part and and why why now are we you know having all these talks of COVID nineteen vaccine and health diplomacy? So, okay, next slide, please. Okay, sorry for the busy slide, but I I think well this is actually um, a busy slide but i think it's it's very understandable we all know that covid-19 as a health issue is is growing far beyond national boundaries um, and we've really seen it um, in in the news we 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 hear it we see it we we watch it it's 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 really like covid-19 every day and how it affects you know relationships as well of of of, of countries um, health has become really more political, I think. Uh, I think uh, that's a fact now. It, before, it's, uh, I would say, maybe not so much, but really now health has become more political. Health and vaccines is now considered as a global public good. And I think more countries now are considering it really as a goal of foreign policy. And I think really, as I've mentioned, uh, post-COVID-19, it's going to be uh, different. Like, uh, I think even in the field, probably, or our students here, you are students of international studies, 
maybe post COVID nineteen, you might have a new module on health diplomacy and you know other, I would say non traditional forms of diplomacy. No, because it's it's really I think really this pandemic has affected all corners. No, and I think it's uh. Well, it's it's really has been recognized as a goal of foreign policy. There is that Oslo ministerial declaration sometime in in two thousand and nine by by some countries, and and this has really um, paved way for an Oslo ministerial declaration on on health and foreign policy. So, what COVID nineteen has done is that it prompted necessary interaction in negotiations among governments and states, as well as non state actors and multilateral institutions. And I think this is the core of what we call, you know, in the core of what we call global health diplomacy. So this is um uh, what I think from at least the scholars part or in terms of uh, health diplomacy. Um, um, this is the what we call the pyramid of. GHD Global Health Diplomacy, which was adapted from the article of Katz defining health diplomacy, changing demands in the era of globalization, wherein it stated that there are various levels of diploma health diplomacy, which is like you know core health diplomacy. There's multi-stakeholder health diplomacy and informal um, health diplomacy. So when you go up. You know, it becomes more formal, basically. Uh, so, in in um, and there are fewer number of practitioners with greater specificity as to grow up, go up the pyramid, and as you go down, there are greater number of practitioners and less specificity. So, um, in you can just change basically this into uh, core vaccine diplomacy, core <laughs> multi-stakeholder vaccine diplomacy and informal so i think it it still applies and and the thing is with when it's when we core when we say core diplomacy it's really i think the interaction and negotiations among governments and states which is i think what i'm really doing at the moment is more the core health diplomacy because these are bilateral and multilateral treaties agreements between and among governments and states um we have also multi multi stakeholder health diplomacy we're in um we you know the partnerships among government in, and agencies and institutions are there including multilateral actors so especially dealing with the un the who which are very important especially in this time and then um lastly is the uh, informal health diplomacy we're in you know this is um interaction between public health actors and their counterparts in the field so when we talk about vaccine diplomacy the central issue is really like the supply of vaccines and this various um you know levels in the pyramid of global health diplomacy is up, up, is applied and we'll we'll see a, a, a more of this as we as i go along with the presentation next slide so in terms of diplomacy and international health cooperation during the pandemic uh, based on what i see on what has been happening since last year um, the major areas of cooperation where international health cooperation is really needed is in uh, the following area. So I see five. So first is about the donations. So you all know that all of the vaccines so far that we have at the moment, where I think we have about 1.5 or 1.6 million vaccines, all those doses are actually uh, donations, right? So we ha I, I said like it, it, we have been you know, jumping from one uh, donation to the other. Initially, it was, uh, you know, and in it was initially like the masks and the PPE. So it came about that it's like, initially there was mask and PPE diplomacy, then it became testing kits diplomacy, and then it became, um, you know, now it's, it's vaccine diplomacy. And next time, I think it's going to be like the, cold chain equipment diplomacy because uh, we need cold chain when we do like the whole vaccination process already. And resource mobilization in terms of loans and grants is another major area. So most of the vaccines, we actually had to a loan from uh, World Bank and ADB 
And then there's also the solidarity trials, which is participation in, in these clinical trials on therapeutics and vaccines. So Philippines is an active participant for this. We are also participating in the Abigan trial, which was um, uh, the trial conducted by the government of Japan. And then we also see in terms of international health cooperation, the surveillance, uh, because you know our national, especially for the Philippine context, it's very important because 10% of our population is either working or living overseas. So um, we all have you know um, relatives who are abroad. Um, one in 10 Filipinos basically, uh, well now maybe less because we're 114 million. So um, we have to do surveillance for them as well. And I think the fifth main area is really what we're talking about. It's really about vaccine negotiations in the close. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. And you see this in the news, you know, uh, I see, um, I just put some of the articles that I've been reading the past few days, especially like the latest one is the first one on the left. It's the vaccine wars, the ASEAN and the quad. So now there's the quad, uh, uh, India, Japan, Australia, and the US. And, you know, countering all the moves that's been, uh, China's been doing. Uh, the, um, the diplomat has, I read this article on China-Southeast Asian vaccine diplomacy coming into relief. Like most of the countries, which is actually for Philippines, that's it's true because our first donated vaccine and our first procured vaccine is actually from China. And yeah, and then we'll talk about this one, the issue, the concept of vaccine multilateralism, which is in this article in Forbes last year, it says, Vaccine multilateralism is the alternative to vaccine nationalism. And we've been really seeing this that uh, I think I attended the executive board meeting of the WHO um, just earlier this year. And the director general, Ted Ross, is really saying that we're in the verge of um, you know, a moral catastrophe because countries are, you know, line, you know, are favoring more on vaccine nationalism and and not really um, uh, giving high importance to multilateralism at this stage, which is, I think I'll discuss later, which for me, vaccine multilateralism is basically the COVAX facility. Next slide. Nate, next slide. So yeah, I'll discuss that. Okay, next. So what is the COVAX facility? So the COVAX facility is um, basically, um, it's the facility, it's one of the three pillars of what we call the ACT, the accelerator or the access to COVID-19 tools accelerator. It's a groundbreaking global collaboration to accelerate the development, production and equitable access to three things, COVID-19 tests, treatments and vaccine. So just one pillar is the vaccine. So it's focused on providing innovative and equitable access to the vaccines. This is led by Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccine Initiative, and the coalition, the CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Inter Innovations and the WHO. So basically, its aim is to accelerate the development of these vaccines. So next slide. So what the COVAX facility is, I think, in, in a nutshell, it's like really um, a facility for solidarity of countries wherein um, you know we are trying to pull the, the demand so that we can have like commitment for the supply. So it's the uh, the goal is to support the largest actively managed portfolio of vaccine candidates, which we have seen has has been uh, really going really well to deliver two billion doses by end of 2021. So by end of this year, we're gonna have two billion doses. And indeed we have benefited from, from the COVAX facility because the first doses of AstraZeneca actually comes from the COVAX facility. Um, yeah, so the, the aim at hand is to really end the acute phase of the pandemic by, by this year. So hopefully we'll see some normalcy by next year. Next slide. Next slide, please. So 
I think I've told you about this in terms of, you know, pulling the demand and basically consolidating the buying power. And so we can have a more broad uh, portfolio for the vaccine. Because as I mentioned, there can just be no one vaccine because no manufacturer can ever produce, you know, the required amount for the entire world at that and uh, at the pace that it is needed. So we need really like the full demand so that manufacturers can have access also to a massive demand assured market. Next slide. So the COVAX facility is actually in a way twofold. There's like, it, it, it also serves as host to what they call the AMC 92 countries, which is Advanced Market Commitment 92, which is an, uh, supported by ODA from various countries. So, so the main um, donors for the AMC 92 country are the US and the EU mainly. Um, so, and Philippines is fortunately part of the AMC 92. That's why we're receiving the first few doses. So, so the COVAX AMC is basically a solidarity mechanism wherein the poor countries can actually be assured that the first 20% of the population can be vaccinated. So uh, the premise of being part of the AMC 92 is for COVAX facility to basically produce the 20% requirement of the countries, at least 20%, which would serve basically your, your health workers, your elderly population, those who are at more high risk in terms of getting severe COVID. So that's the, that's the concept of the AMC 92, that countries will get at least 20% of their uh, required doses to vaccinate the, the, the population. Next slide. So you see, um, these are the AMC 92 countries from low income, lower middle income, and other IDA eligible. So you see Philippines there, uh, one of the 92 countries. Um, there was an election actually for this. Among this, we, um, Indonesia became the, basically the chair of the AMC 92. So they, so in meetings of the COVAX facility, it's Indonesia was actually um, negotiating on behalf of the 92 AMC eligible countries. Next slide, please. Mm, yeah, so I think I mentioned this slide is that it's just saying that we can't put all our baskets in one, uh, all our eggs in one basket. We have to mitigate the risks because not, not one manufacturer can produce all the vaccines that are needed. And since all of them, as you know, are still uh, vaccines under development, you have to, yeah, I forgot to tell you that you have to be reminded all of the vaccines that we're using now, they are not yet licensed vaccines. They are just issued what we call an EUA or an emergency um, use authorization. So that's why you might, uh, for some of you, you might note na parang like the private companies can actually buy them. They have to do a tripartite agreement with the Department of Health because these vaccines are not really available in the market. It's still in an EUA. So EUA for us, it's still, it's still in a phase three trial. So when you look at the vaccine research and development or the drug research and development milieu, it's actually there's phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, and still in phase three. They need still post-marketing surveillance, which is phase four, before they can actually grant a license for you to be able to purchase just like, you know, any other health commodities. So all of these are still trial drugs, basically. Yeah. So there are some drugs that are being developed, but, um, you know, we find it out that maybe later it's not going to reach, you know, phase four. So that's all. So that's why... Um, the COVAX facility is trying to support some of these vaccines so that, you know, we can um, develop them fast. Yeah, so there's a basket of 10 to 15 vaccine candidates. There's a, uh, like a Sinovac and, all, and AstraZeneca, Pfizer, they are in actually the wave one. There's also being developed a wave two vaccine candidate. Next slide, please. So, are still, I'm still okay with time. Okay, I'm gonna, trying to rush that. Um, 
so beyond the multilateralism, so this is really like the world of the, the actual diplomacy on the bilateral, which is, I think, the vaccine nationalism. So next slide. So um, I think, um, well, I'm a bit biased. Next slide, please. I'm a bit biased on this because like as, as we know, um, as we know, um, we need this, um, uh, we need this vaccine, so that's why we need to to um, to develop um, uh, to negotiate for 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 us to get them and sign the supply agreements. So these are are the vaccines that are uh, we have been negotiating. So the ones with the star are already signed, um, and some are still for signing. So these are the ones that are being procured. It's not the ones that are being donated. Yeah. So this is using money from the Philippine government and from our loans from World Bank and ADB. Next slide, please. And beyond that, we have also in the regional mechanism, the ASEAN COVID-19 Response Fund, which is also being supported by, by EU. Um, and uh, I, think it, I think countries will get a fair share of, uh, of um, support from the ASEAN Response Fund and the other multilaterals, which I've already mentioned. Next slide. Mm, yeah, and other considerations in terms of the access to vaccines. So it's not just like we get them and then that's it. So there's all a lot of issues, how we get them and how we will then do the vaccination. So this is actually COVID-19 vaccination is the largest that we'll be doing in the history. Next slide, please. In the history of the Philippines. So so this is really also unprecedented for us at the Department of Health. So the vaccine access scenario, I've told you, there's supply from COVAX facility, we get from donation, and then the government procurement. Domestic production, we don't have that. So uh, X for number four. But I've discussed this. So next slide, please. And next slide. I think I, I won't discuss this budget. I want to give time to for more questions, I think. So I think. But I think I wanted to focus on this, that after the we get them, the shipment here. So there's an issue of storage, how we distribute them, how we deployment, uh, how, what, the, the needed uh, human resources to do the vaccination, assessment, evaluation, monitoring, data management, and so many things. All right, next slide. And this is the prioritization, which is we're still in A1, priority eligible group A, number one. And then I think by, by next month, uh, we'll go to the uh, A2, which are the senior citizens. Next slide. So you see um, the distribution and deployment, we also have to consider this and it's quite different. It, depending on the vaccines. So as I mentioned, not all vaccines are created equal. So it will depend on, the deployment strategy will depend on the vaccine as well. Next slide. So I think I'm gonna leave you with this, um, just to reiterate that uh, um, this just four things. First is this is no, no borders, nor does it recognize any nation or state. A health threat anywhere is a health threat everywhere. Um, the international health cooperation in this locality is vital in this stage, I think, um, especially in a pandemic. Cooperation really saves lives. Uh, the access to vaccines require evidence-based policies and multi-sectoral whole-of-government, whole-of-society approach. Remember, as I've emphasized, vaccines are not all created equal. And really, I think there's an urgent need to mainstream health in foreign policy and diplomacy. If COVID-19 is indeed a war, we we know all wars represent a failure of dip diplomacy, as said by Tony Ben. I leave you with a quote from Dr. Ted Ross, whom I fortunately met outside my office one time when he visited here in Manila. Uh, Global health security is only as strong as its weakest link. No one is safe until everyone is safe. All right. So I think with that, next slide, please. I end the presentation. So let us all be the solution. And hopefully, we'll have some questions after the. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Um, 
Okay. Are there questions from the group? Uh, so that Dr. Buenaventura may be able to answer them. Yes, uh, I, Sheena, can you please state your full name and then your course and then your question, please? Thank you, Sheena. Maybe just some clarificatory because probably we can have the questions after the reactors. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah. So. Okay, let me. Oh, okay. Sheena, wait. Okay. All right, Sheena. Can you now can I have audio? You can now share your question and then also introduce yourself, please. Hello. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Bonaventura, for that very insightful discussion. I think all of us really learned from um, this uh, this uh, new developments in health diplomacy and vaccine diplomacy. I myself uh, have really I learned a lot from from the discussion, and I really look forward also to the reactions of our faculty members. So, if it's all right with you um, to also just hear first. Oh, okay. So Sheena just said her question here. So if you may allow me to read it. Is there, are there any facilities that the government is currently building to support the increasing cases of COVID-19 patients? As we all know that hospitals, particularly here in the Metro, are all congested. So um, I think this is not entirely related to the vaccine diplomacy, but in, in case uh, Dr. Buenaventura will be in a position to answer. So, sir? Yes, I think definitely there are there are plans and also like to augment the manpower. Um, this is, I think, uh, there's a, actually a whole of government um, uh, um, uh, group that, that takes care of this. So this is under response and uh, there's a task group on, on treatment in, in, the, in the hospital um, um, facility. So, so this is being, I think, being addressed and there, there are plans actually for this. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question from Anisa. Um, good afternoon, sir. Uh, well, um, uh, the International Studies Department, she's one of our students. Uh, she is asking, in your opinion, do you think that there is xenophobia and prejudice happening toward how most Filipinos view the Sinovac vaccine considering its origin? Um, somehow I think there is, I would say personally, because I think, I mean, of course, culturally, we also say uh, it's, it's sometimes, I think, more cultural than, than really xenophobia and uh, parang Diba pag China, uh, low, I, I think in a way we equate, you know, goods that are made in China as low quality. But but right. I think in terms of, uh, I would maybe correct that because in terms of vaccine production, it's quite stringent. I think in a way what what uh, what highlight, uh, what, what maybe um, 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 what happened here is also because China was not able to produce a lot of the research studies which the other other candidate uh, vaccines have have given. So so I think that somehow added to the to that prejudice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think it's also um, good that you also mentioned earlier that the Chinese vaccine is actually uh, using a the more traditional and more accepted yes. um, method. So. I think it's also uh, good to note that it is a reliable, reliable, reliable vaccine. No, so um, very so good. That, you you kind of you did get that point. So yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there's another. There are several questions. You want me to go over them, or do you want me to allow um, the readers to? Yeah, share yeah, yeah I'm. 
yeah, if with the maybe for permission of Francis, because I might need to like yeah need to talk to my undersecretary. So maybe I'll, I can answer the questions, but I'll try okay. to stay as long. So so okay. s- since I still have time and my USEC still hasn't done that. So, so we appreciate that. Yeah, I, I can try to answer. I can I can just read through it so okay. it we can also have faster uh, you know, uh, anyway. So I think with with the from Keybart, Likaya, and how can we penalize to those who are not on the priority list that juggles to be vaccinated? That's a cultural question. Um, like, parang ganyan yung Filipino eh, parang you know we have that culture <laughs> somehow. So, and um, I think by law it, there there should be I think in the in the IRR of the vaccination. Uh, that has to be some some penalty clauses that has to be included. So, so so yeah. But yeah, because I think you know health is devolved to the local government. That's also one thing that you have to consider when we talk about implementation. So as national government, we can just give policies, but then the implementation would be up to the local government. So somehow there's that gap in terms of you know the devolution of healthcare services in the country. So. I think I leave it at that. Um, from I, from Sir Bernard Garcia, you mentioned that Sinovac is the more trusted platform. How will you persuade the Filipino people to trust Sinovac? I would say not really just Sinovac, but like um, all this has, I think in terms of how the world approaches it, um, um, you know, there's rigorous process. So for me, I don't, I mean, I'm not, I would say I give my trust to the vaccine experts in the country, to those who are evaluating the vaccines. So, um, so I leave it to them. I, as I've told you, I'm not a vaccine expert, but um, I, I would say that uh, if they certify that and they and our authorities have given the EUA or the emergency use authorization, then uh, I would trust. I would I would have gotten Sinovac as well if if Sinovac was the one that was due for my vaccination. So, yeah. Um, good afternoon uh, from IE department. Uh, what can you say about the 7,000 vaccine in Bicol that wasn't injected? Um, it's actually not, a, what I heard is not a freezer malfunction. It's actually a malfunction of the temperature data logger. So, so you know, when, when you transport vaccine, it, there's a, there's a temperature tracker there, which we call the temperature data logger. So basically that machine malfunctioned, but then when it arrived, so if it malfunctioned, it won't generate the report, like how, how many centigrade was it during the transport. But um, they said that it's in the, sa- the other data loggers in the same, uh, same box, didn't, which were not malfunctioning, actually reported a good you know, uh, temperature during the transport. So it's just that they have to discard it because, yeah, basically the data logger malfunctioned. So, so we are on the side of safety. So that's what happened. But it's um, it's not a freezer malfunction. Yeah, from Mum Bernadette, since the vaccines are being manufactured, how you make sure they will be distributed fairly, um, especially in poor communities? Well, actually the. Uh, in, when you look at the prioritization, the the indigent people are actually A3 or A4. So they're high up in, they're in priority A. So, but then again, as I've told you, the in terms of implementation, it's going to be uh, because under our laws, uh, RA 7160, uh, the health is devolved to the local government. So it's going to be up to the lo- local government and they have to be accountable for that. The DOH basically provides the guidance on the allocation, and then it's the local government who will implement. Um, opinion on how Philippines offer Filipino nurses in exchange for vaccines when we ourselves is in need. Yeah, that's a very valid question. But uh, I think I, I believe migration is a choice. And of course, hopefully it's not a forced choice, but. Um, I think people also, we have to also recognize that some other nurses really want to, you know, get out and we cannot force them to stay. It's, it's, it's their choice, basically. Just like um, 
you know, they also have the right to work where they want to work. So we cannot force them. But government is has like the deployment program. Like for example, we have nurses to the barriers program, just like the doctors to the barriers program as well. So we we do try to supplement those areas which is in dire need. Oh, lots of questions, sir. Do I have time to answer everything? So, okay, you sex not yet here. Okay, how does mayor's got vaccine job? Ah, uh, okay, so it's the mayor. So, na binabraso ang ating health worker. So, yeah, I think I I would decline answering the very <laughs> political question. I would say. Okay. Uh, um, but again, I think we have to really see this in the light of what the law says about, you know, implementation, because I think that's also what one of our problems, because under the law, it's really the local government. So um, it's actually an, a DILG issue, not a DOH issue. Okay, with that, thank you very much, Dr. Benaventura, for the mm -hmm. time and also for uh, mm -hmm. sharing your insight with us um in case we'll be you will be available to stay with us until yeah. after the faculty reactors are done with their pieces and you know we, we will very much appreciate having you again for another round of i guess discussion so mm -hmm. thank you sir so yes. thank you to everyone who to stay but uh right. congratulations in advance and thank you just in case i don't Get to stay. <laughs> thank you so much, sir. Okay, so um, thank you also everyone who asked their questions and who posted um, comments on uh, the chat box. So may so now we will move to our panel discussion with our faculty reactors. So the first uh, reactor is the chair of our Department of Medical Technology, Mr. Albert Benny Dolores. So, sir. Uh, if you are already ready, whenever you're ready, sir. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you very uh, much. Paul. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Benaventura, for the enlightening talk. Um, don't worry, the, my reaction will just be quite short. Lang, no? So as much as we want to deny it, public health is inherently political. Part of WHO's building blocks of health system includes health leadership and gover governance. Leadership and governance in building a health system involves ensuring that strategic policy framework exists and are combined with effective oversight, coalition building, which is present right now, regulation, and attention to system design and accountability, among others. The need for greater accountability arises both from increased funding and a growing demand to demonstrate results. Protecting the public's health requires the elevation of evidence-based forecasting in order to anticipate nationwide resource needs before a disaster demands them. The only entity with the capacity to mount a sufficiently sizable response when a large population is endangered is the government. Truly, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the vital importance of partnership with nations and forging alliances to confront shared public health threats. It also shows why we need strengthened multilateralism and top quality diplomacy. Obviously, the COVID-19 vaccines have now become an effective tool of diplomacy as both displayed by China and India earlier this month. The threat of the pandemic is one area where nations can work together across ideological divides to find common solutions to common problems. Fighting diseases, in fact, long been used as a means for extending soft power and winning friends. Superpower rivalries for influence through the needle have sometimes even been positive. The success of the smallpox eradication, for example, campaign was in part fueled by the rivalry between Soviet Union and US. At the end of the day, health is a political choice that can and must transcend geopolitics. Regardless of the intent, alongside with traditional public health measures, how quickly countries can collectively expand vaccine manufacturing and vaccine rollout to different countries all over the globe will determine how soon we can control the pandemic. Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you, Sir Benny, for your um, reaction. Um, may I also now call on our next faculty reactor, Mr. Jovito Jose Katigbak. He is um, with our uh, International Studies Department, and he also um, has worked with Dr. Buenaventura, if I am not mistaken. So whenever you're ready, Sir Katigbak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Bianca. No? And before I give my reaction, this is going to be very brief as well. I'd like to thank FEU uh, for inviting me to be a reactor. Uh, as Thank you also to Dr. Uh, Joel Benaventura for the info, uh, informative presentation. Very comprehensive and it tackles a number of things. So let me go straight to my reaction. I think the what's happening around us is set in the context of a globalized world. And uh, the rise of different actors, of non-state actors, as well as transnational issues, such as health crisis, you know, uh, concerns about the economy, have actually emphasized the role of not only the state, but as I mentioned, of different actors. And so in a health crisis that we're experiencing now, uh, I go back to Dr. Joel's point, a health threat, a health threat, any, health threat, uh, health threat anywhere is a health threat everywhere. So a localized issue may become quickly a, a global issue if not addressed properly. And so the role of cooperation from a liberal perspective becomes very much highlighted, okay? Uh, people coming together, states, different actors coming together to resolve a common issue. But of course, just like all other things, you know, uh, there's only, there's no dominant perspective. And so other per perspective uh, in terms of international relations, such as realism, which is actually embodied in what we call vaccine nationalism, have emerged. States, governments acquiring disproportionate amount of vaccines to ensure the safety and welfare of their citizens uh, at the uh, expense of poorer countries or countries that don't have the ability to procure vaccines actually showed the gap or the dissonance in terms of how states and other actors perceive the health crisis that you are now facing. And so more than ever, what we need is a spirit of cooperation. The, the practice of diplomacy comes into play. The ability of one country to negotiate uh, and procure the necessary treatment, the necessary vaccines, and the necessary funding to ensure that everyone or it's every, every citizen is inoculated as well as uh, provided the necessary health care amid the COVID-19 pandemic, hence is a, has become a central issue in terms of uh, relations with other countries. And so my point here is that we must have capable diplomats as well as staff, not only in the DFA, as well as other agencies, uh, specifically DOH, uh, DTI, and other uh, line agencies that are very much important in shaping policy at the domestic level. Thank you very much again to Dr. Joel for emphasizing the different aspects when you look at vaccines. And we must remember that vaccines are not all created equal. The nuances that you've underlined very much help us uh, in terms of discerning what are the challenges in procuring and uh, inoculating our fellow men? Uh, we hope that this is not uh, the last time that we'll be able to hear from you. And uh, thank you very much for the insights that you've shared. As for me, as, as for a professor, as for a student as well of international relations, the environment that we are in constantly changes. It's a dynamic environment. And so the only thing that remains constant is a national interest. Okay, it's always the pursuit in terms of diplomacy. With that, I end my uh, my uh, reaction. And uh, thank you very much once again to FEU as well as to Dr. Joel and to our uh, to the organizers of this event. Thank you very much, Sir Katigbak. So 
Okay. So I just uh, listed down some of the notes that I made no, or I took down from the presentation of Dr. Benaventura and also from our reactors and maybe um, Sir Francis or Sir Mark or the other faculty members later might want to add. But uh, I think these are the highlights for me. So one, there are several levels, again, of health diplomacy. So at the very uh, bottom level, you have public work, uh, health workers and their counterparts. And then um, Dr. Bonaventura mentioned about multi-stakeholders, non-state actors, and um, their work with the government. And uh, of course, at the top, you have the governments working with other states, no, engaging in in um, different agreements no, in order to uh, procure needed, uh, in, in this case, no, the vaccines that we need. No. And then, of course, I, I would just like to reiterate again what uh, Mr. Katigbak and also Dr. Benaventura ha ha has repeated also um, quite uh, a lot earlier that, you know, not all vaccines are created equal. So I appreciate that we were also informed that some vaccines are really not ready for certain demographics. And this information, I think, is very crucial for us as uh, citizens and also as students of international studies. At least we now know that you know it, it's not only a question of being able to procure the vaccines, it's being able to procure the right ones, uh, especially for certain demographics. And then there are also again, different types of vaccines and approaches to develop them. And uh, I think this is also very helpful in terms of dispelling a lot of the um, uh, misgivings about existing vaccines that we have now. And I think one of the, one of the things that I also gathered from at least uh, health professionals who, who have been giving their interviews you know, on TV and everywhere else that you know, the best vaccine is the available vaccine. So uh, we need to trust our vaccine experts, right? So to be able to just move forward, I guess, with, with um, uh, our, our initiative to inoculate you know, our population. And then, of course, uh, I also... Um, I want to highlight what Dr. Buenaventura mentioned that you know we need a good mix of vaccines because the key issue now is not really um, how or if we are going to get the vaccines, but when, right? And that not all manufacturers will be able to supply all of the vaccines that you know any country will need. And so therefore we need a good mix of all of the vaccines um, that are available and out there you know, for, for purchase. You know? so, and I also appreciated um, the discussion on COVAX and how uh, you know this facility also helps different countries to uh, be able to um, acquire you know, the vaccines that they will require among other things in order to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, from um, the reactions of uh, Mr. Katigbak and Sir Benny, you know, we, we also gathered that you know, cooperation is key. We need to be able to work together. Um, this is really an unprecedented issue. And you know, in, in our case, it's the government that is in the best position to really provide um, solutions. And I, I guess for me uh, personally also, I, I think um, another crucial matter that we, we need to also consider is, you know, what is the timeline really for, for the vaccine rollout and what, what can we expect? And I guess um, we were not able to touch more on how, I guess the private sector will be able to assist as well in the vaccination program of the government. But I understand that there are already conversations about this and how um, indeed the private sector will be uh, a crucial component of this initiative. So I guess without, uh, if there are any other um, ad and additions to what we shared, I will already um, ask for the uh, presentation of our certificate for our... Maybe, Bianca, 
Sorry. Yes, yes, Dr. Bonaventura. You're still here. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'm still here. Um, I think it's fine. I, I wanted to to highlight a bit because I, I also got some direct messages and I tried answering it. I think uh, some of the things that I, I think maybe um, some, some things that we, I think, as students also of international studies, you have to think about. Um, well, basically, I think, um, but first, before that, I think the issue on the, just the one, the last issue that, that, that I wanted to address, the one on the private sector. The thing is, I think you have to understand that um, all this, as I mentioned, is still at EUA phase. So when it's still EUA, uh, it still is government who's basically responsible because if there will be an adverse reaction, um, it should be like the government who, who has to take care of that. And I think that's that's the that's the uh, main idea why uh, you know private cannot just buy uh, you know the vaccine. Mm -hmm. They had to get it. They have to sign basically a tripartite agreement with the Department of Health and the supplier because basically yeah. it's an EUA. Once we get this vaccine's license, then that, that, that's the time. So if they did phase four trial and then they get their market authorization, uh, which is basically the license for the vaccines, then, you know, private can just like get it directly. But if yeah. it's still EUA phase, it has to go through government. So some people don't understand that. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, I mean, that's, that's also the reason it's more like, you know, uh, to really try to ensure that if it, when there's like uh, adverse reaction, the reporting also, because, you know, right. it, it, there's that uh, process as well, like the AEFIs, the adver adverse events following immunization. So we have to really bear that in mind. I think for international students, I think I, I wanted this to, you know, like I think more of the things that you have to really look at is, is you know, the vaccine nationalism versus the issue of vaccine multilateralism. And I think vaccine nationalism is quite a big issue right now because you see, uh, I think I, I read some some also like articles that are, you know, the richer countries are actually hoarding the vaccines. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. the U.S. So for me, I mean, um, well, based on my values, of course, of solidarity, you know, I think Filipinos are more of the solidarity people, but in terms of the values, I mean, if you can imagine a world where all of the, say, for example, of all of the citizens in the U.S. would be vaccinated, and like a single health worker in Africa hasn't been vaccinated, that's really, and an, I mean, that for me is totally not acceptable. And that is, you know, being driven now by, I would I, how I see it, my personal view is really, you know, how how the world is in terms of, you know, profit, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, looking after profits. Because, like, these companies will actually prefer, I would say, because, you know, they are, uh, anyway, at the end of the day, accountable to the stockholders of the company. Then, and they, this, the vaccine company manufacturers are actually, you know, after profit, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, they would actually, if that's their, you know, their man, their nature, that's, that's the, you know, then they would really uh, go for vaccine nationalism because it will drive the price up. It will, you know, get, you get more money out of like the, the same transaction. Mm -hmm. So yeah. versus going through the multilateral route, getting it from the COVAX facility where there's full demand, full, su full uh, supply, mm -hmm. but it takes longer. So the impatience of countries and the political pressure of countries to get to get vaccines right now where the supply is really low. So it's a very fluid supply dependent environment wherein countries really try to get deals and negotiate so that they can actually at least have vaccines for their people yeah. and and that's totally understandable as well for you know for the political side and right. so all these factors i think is in to play uh economic factors political factors um but really i think um i think also like maybe in terms of the idea of nation states is really like you know protecting their own 
people and things like that but disregarding you know i mean all this solidarity um 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 uh, issues is is yeah. something that we are really in right now and 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 i think that's that's really what is happening uh right. in the world like we will as the wh i was told you the who director general said we're in the verge of a moral catastrophe in terms of vaccine because you know people in the the reality is also philippines in its stance in the international arena you know is mainly a spectator and we're really just dependent on what supply somehow gets mm-hmm. to us but right. it's the rich the superpowers and the major powers they're the ones um you know controlling the supply and and if they say no we'll we'll vaccine nationalism first like we supply right. first our our countries and you see that also in in europe they they also block like the export of astrazeneca after yeah. some time so yeah. i mean this will become more and more frequent and and the issue of vaccine nationalism versus multilater- multilateralism and solidarity is really i think evident you see that in the news day in day out as a practitioner and you know avid fan of international relations i think this is something that you would uh, it's interesting and I, mm-hmm. i i hope people will also appreciate that in the next yeah. few days I think like when people do not really monitor how how the vaccination programs of other countries are rolling out um I think they're missing the point but I think we're missing the point because I I think it's only when they're done with their vaccination it's the only time when developing countries are actually able to to access the the vaccines out there so thank you again Dr. Bonaventura and I'm really sorry to all of our students who are unable to raise their questions but probably if you can um submit your questions to us in the chat in the chat box then maybe we can share with Dr. Bonaventura and you know you can directly <laughs> message Dr. Bonaventura if he has time to to reply but you can send them to us also even via email and then we can uh, i guess share it to Dr. Bonaventura and at a later time we can also share his replies no and um so without further ado i guess i can also may request our um Sir Kebar to present the flash our certificate for Dr. Bonaventura okay so Um, I just want to read the certificate, sir. So Far Eastern University Institute of Arts and Sciences presents the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Buenaventura, Joel Buenaventura, for his valuable contribution as a speaker during the webinar vaccine entitled Vaccine Health and Diplo- Vaccine and Health Diplomacy in the Time of COVID-19. Given this 26th day of March 2021 at the Far Eastern University Manila so signed by Mr. Francis Esteban the chair of Department of International Studies and of course um, by Dean Ruena Capulong Reyes of the Institute of Arts and Sciences so thank you thank you so much sir we hope that this won't be the last um, webinar that you will do with us and um, yeah we hope to see more of you soon and Um, thank you everyone for your participation and I think Sir Francis also posted a uh, an assessment form over the chat box if you can kindly also answer um, the assessment form so please everyone who participated thank you so much po. and so sorry I will also now call on Sir Mark Isla please for our um, closing remarks our associate dean from the Institute of Arts and Sciences um, whenever you're ready Sir Mark thank you hi Bianca good afternoon can you hear me yes sir we can hear I can hear you yeah thank you So to our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Benaventura, uh, Dean Rowena Capulong Reyes, um, the Dean of the Institute of Arts and Sciences, to Mr. Francis Esteban, the Chair of the Department of International Studies, our dear faculty members, students, friends, a pleasant afternoon to all. First, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Joel Benaventura, 
of the Department of Health for graciously accepting our invitation to speak about the topic of vaccine diplomacy, which is a topic that is less discussed or not part of the usual conversations, at least in our country. Indeed, um, the problem that we are facing right now is a global health crisis. All countries are affected in one way or another, and the approach should be from the perspective of public health governance. However, as mentioned by our speaker, as of this moment, the supply of the vaccine is an important consideration. It became a scarce resource. And since it is a public good, and given, all, uh, given that all countries are trying to find a durable solution to the pandemic that affects all facets of global economy, many became concerned about the concept that we call nation, vaccine nationalism. So as you know, vaccine nationalism occurs when governments sign agreements with pharmaceutical manufacturers to supply their populations with vaccines ahead of them becoming available for other countries. Even before many of the now approved COVID-19 vaccinations had completed their clinical trials, wealthy countries such as across Europe, Asia, and America had procured several million of doses of the ones that seemed to be most promising. This is a serious concern because it will certainly hurt many developing countries that are not capable of developing their own vaccine. Good thing that the World Health Organization and other organizations created the Vaccine Multilateral Solidarity Effort, which is another form of uh, vaccine diplomacy. Now that various pharmaceutical companies rolled out their vaccines, the focus specific or especially for international observers is now on the vaccine diplomacy. Major global players had been doubling their efforts to put an end to the pandemic and use the rollout of vaccines to gain influence to other countries. For example, we have China and Russia immediately assured many developing countries um, that vaccines will be given to them in recognition of their bilateral relations. Vaccine diplomacy has also involved efforts to undermine the trust in, uh, in the intentions and efficacy of rival powers. China and Russia have both been accused by governments of Western countries um, of state-backed disinformation campaigns seeking to undermine trust in vaccines and produce um, in several regions. I believe that the reason why the distribution of vaccines became highly politicized is because of the strings attached to the fulfilled promises of major players. You may be getting vaccines just like what they've been telling the world, but at what cost in your obligation to countries that are wrapping their international aid in conditions? often involving aspirations for trade deals. We can't blame people for thinking this way because in a near realist perspective, states can never be certain about the intentions of other states. This is indeed an interesting topic that could be a subject of further research. I hope that you were able to learn a lot in today's webinar. Rest assured that the Institute of Arts and Sciences and the Department of International Studies will continue to provide programs that can enhance knowledge about issues, particularly in the international context. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you very much, Sir Mark. Um, okay, so if we can request everyone to please um, open their camera so we can have a group photo. All right, uh, I'll be I'll be the one to capture to screen uh, capture. Let me request everyone to give their biggest smile. So yeah, I mean like we have uh, this kind of group photos now. No, dati yung photo natin pag face to face seminars a uh, stage no ngayon ganto na tayo groovy na sa webinars sa Zoom no. All right, so there are three panels here. So uh, please just. Uh, uh, smile and then I'll say or I'll tell you when uh, uh, we're done. Okay, so give us your biggest smile. All right, first panel is done. Second panel. Third panel. 
All right. I guess that's it, everyone. So thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So yeah, uh, we, we call this already a day. Thank you for joining us. And again, please don't forget to answer the evaluation form at the part or which is sent in the chat box. All right.